Thank you, Maprika, welcome. Daka Joey Kare Kumaha Manigua. I am Joey Kare Kumaha Manigua of the Taino Nation of Boyigan, or Puerto Rico. I'm a descendant of the Tainos um, and uh, a member of the Yukiyake Jaguar. Uh, Yukiyake is another term for village or tribe. And uh, this, this presentation is on the evidence pointing to the pre colonial connection of South America, the Caribbean, and the Florida people. Uh, before I, I get into that, I want to give a special thanks out to Pamela Wilson, a librarian of Volusia County Library to Land, who personally invited me here to do this presentation, as well as I'm honored to have Alan Breck, archaeologist who uh, pointed me in the right direction since I started this research in 2016, and he's been supportive ever since. And as well, honored to have uh, editor and writer, author of 13 Taino books, Lynn Guitar, <laughs> and of you. course, I want to give special thanks to my wife for being patient to, be, uh, to let me work on this research and to be able to share it with you today. And then, of course, my daughter, Elena, who is the tech support here for me and helped me set this up because uh, I'm not a date. But um, so to continue on, So the indigenous of the Caribbean are the Taino. And some people may not be aware of who the Taino are. Of course, we are the ones who discovered Columbus lost at sea. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the Taino, uh, you may be surprised also to learn that um, a lot of the words we use today, uh, hurricane, hammock, barbecue, all originate from our ancestors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as, as the Taino migrated from the south, um, that the currents of the Florida Straits uh, magically walled them from migrating any further north to Cuba, uh, from Cuba or the Bahamas, ne never reaching Florida. Another uh, argument was that uh, the, sh uh, the short canoe sound in Florida, you, you guys may not be aware that Florida has the uh, largest collection of archaeological canoes in the world, um, and many of those are short, but that will be explained a little bit later on in the talk. So, and, and this is what got me into thinking, like, why would this barrier, or, you know, the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, Mesoamerica, South America, Florida, were masters of the sea, masters of the cosmos, they should be able to navigate around. Mesoamerica, as many people probably are more uh, commonly uh, aware of who they are with their pyramids, obsidian, weaponry, and their famous ball game. And then the indigenous people of Florida. Many may be surprised to know that the original peoples of Florida is not the Seminole. There's many different tribes in Florida that would operate or pay tribute to uh, a couple of dominant tribes, for instance, the Calusa in southwest Florida, as well as the Ais in northeast Florida. And then, of course, our topic of discussion. We're going to go over the evidence pointing to the pre-colonial Florida being a part of a major trade route and indicating the indigenous of Florida, the Caribbean, and Mesoamerica were related. So the first list of facts is going to be uh, documentation by different people, uh, the Spanish conquistadors, um, as well as other uh, people that have ran into the indigenous of that local area, um, and, and wrote down what they've seen or were told. As well, a couple other uh, statements from different academics that are considered professionals in their individual fields. And the first one we're gonna read about is Columbus on July 30th of 1502, while in Guanaja, uh, Honduras. 
And he states, there arrived at the um a canoe long as a galley and eight feet wide, made of a single tree trunk like the other Indian canoes. It was freighted with merchandise from the western regions around New Spain. Amid ships, it had a palm leaf awning like which the Venetian gondolas carried. This gave complete protection against the rain and waves. Under this awning were children and women and all the baggage and merchandise. Crucibles for smelting ore, gourds, full of beer made from the hubo fruit, and cacao beans as currency. There were 25 paddlers aboard, but they offered no resistance. Here you can see an example of how they made the canoes after they cut the tree down. This is taken from Sebastian Rabot Lamarck's book, Taino and Caribs, the orig aboriginals of the Antilles. It shows them setting the, uh, a small smoldering fire inside the trunk, and chipping away with it with the axe, and then using cross beams to help form the canoe into the shape that they want. One of the largest canoes recorded by Columbus was a beautiful canoe in Baracoa, Cuba measuring 65 feet with an estimated occupancy of 150 people. As well as another canoe in Jamaica used by a cacique, or chief, that was estimated to be 97 feet long, 8 feet wide, carrying 70 to 80 men. That half were rowing and the other half resting at the bottom of the canoe. And the average canoes at the time was roughly 30 to 32 to 40 feet, holding up to 40 to 50 feet. According to the log of Ponce de Leon in Boy uh, Voyage in 1513, when he left Puerto Rico, he was seeking the wealthy island of Bimini. Here, uh, sorry, the map kind of got cut off, but this is a Panitas map of 1520. And here in the bottom right, as you see the bottom part of the peninsula, Panita wrote, which is cut off, La Florida, formerly Bimini. So there we have proof that Florida was also called Bimini before uh, or pre-Columbian pre time. Uh, so as he sent off for this wealthy island of Bimini, which he thought by northwest of the Bahamas, or found northwest of the Bahamas, following that course he found Florida. Once departing from the Tartugas, Ponce de Leon laid a course of southwest by west to investigate some islands his indigenous guides had told him about. In this direction, there are no islands, as we know, southwest by west, so it would seem his Indian guides, which he picked up in Florida, convinced Ponce that the wealthy and exotic land he was seeking lay not to the northwest, but to the southwest, which pointed Ponce de Leon straight for the Yucatan, and as we know, the wealth of the Mayans and Aztecs in that area, the indigenous of Florida were definitely aware of our neighbors. The Lucayans, or the Tainos of the Bahamas, they were aware of the indigenous in Florida. I believe it was in 1513, Ponce de Leon's voyage, that he, uh, a Spanish chronicler recorded a, a Taino saying to uh, the chronicler, because the people there were where their secret parts covered with palm leaves woven in a manner of plaiting. And of course, as we mentioned, the Taino of the Greater Antilles outside the Bahamas also called, also had knowledge of Florida, referring to it as Bimini. Not only aware of Florida, but knew how long travel would be to Florida from Cuba. Martin Alonzo Penzin, captain of the Pinta, when on the north shore of Cuba, made a report. States, the Indians said that behind that cape there was a river, and that from that river to Cuba it was four days' journey. He, Pinson, said he understood that this Cuba was a city and that the land was a very extensive mainland, which stretched far to the north, and that the king of that land was at war with the Grand Khan, whom they called Saba, and by many other names. Saba, and you'll hear a lot about this gentleman, Cacique Sababa, or Chief Sababa, also been referred to, and he's the cacique of Tulusa. And we know that Penson, by his description of an extensive, main, extensive mainland, which stretched far to the north, as well as mentioning the cacique of the Colosa, Colusa, that he was referring to Florida, and that it was four days' journey to reach Florida from Cuba, according to the Tainos of Cuba.
the Caribs of the Lesser Antilles had knowledge of overseas travel with canoe. Diego Alvarez Chanca, during Columbus's second voyage, wrote, one and alt make war against all neighboring islands, traveling by sea 150 leagues to attack with their many canoes, which are like small fustas of a single piece of wood. The Spanish leagues reported by Chanca equal 480 nautical miles. Uh, in my research, I, I kind of calculated up by the documentation, of course, is estimated by the chroniclers, the Spanish conquistadors, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, by the miles they calculate up, the indigenous of the Caribbean could travel, well, would be traveling around 12,000 miles. 500. 500? Yeah. But that's, that's enough to take across the Caribbean. Yeah, because mm -hmm. from here to Haiti, I'm I believe, it's, bar, it's, bad, it's only yeah. 800 miles. Oh, it's less than that. Yeah, so. The, the distance that is recorded and where they're seen throughout the Caribbean uh, is obviously uh, not an issue for them to travel. The Mayans also had knowledge of the Caribs, of the Lesser Antilles, of the warlike people. In the book Chalam Balam of Chumayal, which is reported to be the most accurate and best preserved of the 16th century Maya historical documents. The report reads, five ahal. There came the foreigners without skirts was their name. The country was not conquered by them. Archaeologist of Florida, William F. Keegan reports the Lucayans Pioneers of the Bahamas were connected to a Caribbean-wide trade network. Admiral Columbus observed trade carried between Long Island and Cuba by canoe. A piece of jadeite found on San Salvador Island appears to have originated in Guatemala based on a trace element analysis. And Hartley Burr Alexander states that Arawaks gained a foothold in Florida and their influence, in trade at least, seems to have extended far into the Muscogean territories to the north, while it may have affected the Yucatan and Honduras to the west. Another canoe fact. Oh, I'm going too fast. This is by George Harlow of the American Museum of Natural History, and he states of a discovery of an ancient jade that could shake up the old notions of the New World before Columbus. Scientists say they have traced 1,500-year-old axe blades found in the Eastern Caribbean to ancient jade mines in Central America, 1,800 miles away. The blades were excavated in the late 1990s by a Canadian archaeologist on the island of Antigua in the West Indies. But the jade used to make the blades almost certainly come from, came from Maya mines in distant Guatemala, says mineralogist George Harlow. One of those jade axe heads that was found. William H. Sears, archaeologist who worked on the famous uh, Fort Center site in South Florida. Uh, this is uh, one of many different badges they found. Um, this one's made out of silver, and they have others uh, also made out of gold that they found. And William H. Sears regard uh, states. I regard the design on the front as an Olmec-style jaguar wearing a headdress with a four-direction symbol. Michael Coe concurred, but neither of us can explain its occurrence at this place or time. John Griffin has suggested that it is a spider, and I believe that's what they call it today. Spider guy. Spider guy. They're found all over the state, not just Fort Center. Right. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, uh, I mean the south part of the state. Yeah, south part of the state. Yeah. So here we are with the, the canoe fact. Some of the biggest canoes are estimated to have moved 15,000 pounds. It's also estimated that four tons of maize could be moved in one of the big canoes. The speed is estimated to at two and a half to four kilometers an hour, an estimated 25 to 30 kilometers of potential travel in a day. And that's uh, archaeologist Sarah B. Barber did a, uh, an extensive study on these canoes, and uh, she has a whole YouTube video on how she came up with uh, the data that she did. Sarah B. Barber. 
Again, we have a non-native deer found in the Lesser Antilles, uh, one with Taino lines from the island of Kariku. The canoe facts that Columbus also reported they go in a manner you would not believe, and they sell all the islands, which are innumerable, as well as uh, the canoe shapes are, are different from the northern canoes in, the, in North America. Um, another uh, connection would be as far as the canoes is the pointed paddle that was shared from Florida all the way down to uh, South America. So back to the non-native deer. Uh, to, to show more of the more proof on that trade and Florida being a part of it. So white-tailed and bracket deer, uh, they're, they're not native to the uh, Caribbean, lesser or greater Antilles. And here we have one with Taino and Sipe lines found uh, in Cariku. Non-native to the islands, although not mentioned about much, non-native deer have been found at 29 archaeological sites on seven islands, showing trade again from the mainland of South America to the Caribbean. This next one is one of my favorites. This is a West Indian axe head found near Gainesville, Florida. And the author, J. Walker Fuchs, a prehistoric island culture area of America, states the artifact is West Indian in type, cannot be doubted. It is, quote unquote, ear type, characteristic of the island. Again, found by William H. Sears at the Fort Center site, we have a gold jaguar pendant. And William H. Sears states, it is, I believe, of South American Indian workmanship. The style appears to be pre-Columbian. But jaguars are not in Florida, as we know. We have the, the panther. They're not also in the Caribbean either. But Jaguar were sacred to all three regions, to Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, um, and possibly even Florida as it, as it seems to, to look. But here in uh, Vieques, Puerto Rico Island, uh, west of Borigan, or Puerto Rico, we have an actual jaguar tooth from South America. Crafted out of bone along with unfinished carving and shell of a jaguar tooth, not only showing the importance to my ancestors, viewed how, how they viewed the jaguar, but again, the trade from South America to the Caribbean. Zoomorphic pottery. There's so many different examples. That I, I did not uh, put nearly as much as what I have. I'll be making another video shortly uh, on the stuff that I, I did not include in today's presentation. Uh, but the one on the left is from Dominican Republic. The one on the right is from Florida. From Crystal River, both uh, of the broad motive vessels. And we have some bird motive. This is uh, left is from Puerto Rico, right is from Florida. And I could really go on all day with the different types of zoomorphic pottery. And we have a zoomorphic pipe that Clarence B. Moore, another famous kind of archaeologist uh, is of a special interest having a root animal head below the distal margin of the bowl as shown. <clears throat> Duho. Duho is a short wooden stool that was used by the cacique or the vihike, uh, that is the chief or the vihike or the medicine man or shaman of the Taino, uh, and they would sit on these uh, stools and as they would Council the village or the Ukieke, or uh, in ceremony with uh, as they enter the spirit world. And the one on the left is from Dominican Republic. This, these are just basic examples of duhos because some of the duhos out of the Caribbean are very elaborate with red gold and beautiful <coughs> workmanship with geometric designs. Tainos do a different type of uh, tattooing. Instead of an invasive, you know, pounding in the skin, they
they would use a pigment on a carved geometrical uh, design, either shell, bone, uh, or, or stone. And as, as they did that into the pigment, they would stamp it on their body. So here we have an art, uh, artifact found, again, at the Fort Center site by William H. Sears. And he states that the design was incised with symmetrical areas, heavily incised, and it was then heavily coated with red pigment. I brought some achote today. Uh, people may be aware of achote. It's a modern day spice, as used commonly. And um, I, I think there's not too much argument on what that could be. So, what about plant life? Do we have anything from in Florida that will show a tray as far as plant life, trees, whatnot? In Samoka State Park, while they were dredging, they pulled up a a, a carving, and it was carved out of Brazil wood, which is not native to Florida. It's only found in the Bahamas, Cuba, or Cuba. And according to the Volusia County, Florida website, the mountain on Huntoon Island, home of the Mayacas, plant remains usually are not well preserved in many. Huntoon Island being an exception. In addition to the local species like cypress, pine, bay, cedar, and oaks, the Huntoon Island midden yielded evidence of tropical woods not native to Florida. Another plant, uh, Kuntai is famous. Uh, if you know of Kuntai, it's, it's either because it's a, a landscape, uh, non uh, low maintenance plant that you can have in your yard. You'll see a lot of them at fast food restaurants, medians in the road. Uh, but it was also famous for the Seminoles. This is how they were undefeated by the U.S. military. It, it survived on partially on Kutai down in, uh, way down in the Everglades. But Kutai or Zamia, archaeological evidence for widespread consumption of Zamia is found throughout the Caribbean. Despite the repeated assertion that these plants were not actively cultivated by native peoples in Florida, evidence exists for Zamia as a managed resource or perhaps a crop in the Bahamas. With the well-documented and thorough use of Zania as a starch source in the region, it is perhaps possible that the patterns of genetic diversity of Zania in Florida were influenced by the early native inhabitants, as has been suggested for the patterns of Zania genetic diversity between Jamaica and Little Cayman Islands. The oldest papaya seeds, archaeological finds in North America, uh, as well as 2,000-year-old chili pepper seeds and the tobacco. The papaya and chili pepper seeds are found in Pine Island, Florida, and the tobacco used by the pre-Columbian Florida peoples was the South American variety, the Nicotinium, Nicotinium rustica. So what about burials? Do we have uh, anything as far as burials? I, I, there's quite a bit I did not include uh, in, in this presentation, so there are some things that I'll be adding later, but uh, one of the things I wanted to stand out to include in the presentation is the cranial modification. There's be more found where now is Bay County, Florida. Many of these skulls show great interior posterior flattening as by compression from boards, while some gave evidence of early constriction by a band, a concave depression being evident. The selected skull from this mound is shown in Fig 67. This is one from Cuba. Again, showing the cranial modification. There's a Taino Karib style burial found also in Hutchinson Island. The cranial modification is practiced all the way down to South America as well as other places around the world, but uh, with connecting with everything else that is shown, you can see the influence. What, <clears throat> what about the structures and geological formations? Here we have a crowning terrace of the Great Mount or Pyramid on Demerate Key, Florida, showing platform and conch shell facing. At the Crystal River Archaeological State Park, also where I married my beautiful wife, Illuminata, recently, <laughs> on summer solstice, across the river, the site on Roberts Island is a step towards mounds. That is the same material 
inside through the Centurion Mound in a place near Tabasco, Mexico. Back over the river to the Crystal River Archaeological State Park, you will also find two steles, which one has a crude, quote, crudely carved human face and torso. Mountains were very sacred to the indigenous peoples of all three regions. This is the reason why mounds are built and pyramids are built to take place of that sacred geological form that Mother Earth provides us with the mountains. And unfortunately, up until the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, we had tons of mounds through Florida, up to 40 feet tall and, and, and taller. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, lots of information lost through those lost mounds. So here at the Crystal River State Park, we have uh, one of the steles if you've been there before. So at the top, towards the peak, you can see the <coughs> engraving of the face. Give you a little bit of a description of that. This is what the image would look like. So what about the language? If we communicated, traded, well, there's got to be a bridge between language. You've got to be able to communicate. <coughs> Florida, the Caribbean, and Central South America are, uh, are not all of it, but a lot of it is underneath the, the language umbrella of Arawak. Arawak is the language, obviously, of the Taino and the Caribbean, different dialects, but under the same umbrella. An interesting link is the Kisika and the Kalusa, Kisika Sababa, that I told you we'd be talking about. Uh, Baba is one of the words used for father in the Taino language. So it wouldn't be uh, too difficult to understand the, the Kisike or the chief of the tribe being a father figure and having that name, Sababa. As well, uh, we'll get into a little bit more of that before I jump ahead of myself. So wildlife. Uh, I've, I've talked to Alan uh, several times about different theories on wildlife. One of them is the Florida turkey. Don't have any information on that, um, but it's possible that the Florida turkey might have been brought over. But no, no, no information on that yet. But the crested katakata, the distinctive crested katakata, a raptor that does not migrate and believed to be brought to Florida by ancient Mexicans, known locally in some areas as the Mexican buzzard. The name Katakata is said to be of Guarani Indian origin. Tararo, tararo, derived from the unusual rattling vocalization that the bird utters when agitated. Ironically, the Taino of the Caribbean have a word for this bird as well. Tararo. Found only in Lake, Ocho Lake Okeechobee area of Florida, other than Mesoamerica, Cuba, and slightly into North America. I think this is a, a, a big... Uh, your face thing where the catacatas are nowhere to be found except, which is where Fort Center is, and a lot of the archaeological finds that show that trade and communication and influence from the south. The, the famous barkless dog that Columbus recorded in the Caribbean has been found as well in Florida, an archaeological find. And again, there is others uh, as well as the ivory uh, bill woodpecker that has been speculated to be part of a bird trade from the Caribbean to Florida, which uh, you know originally thought that it was extinct. If you're not aware, they have cited it, I believe in Ohio and a couple other states up there, um, but the ivory billed woodpecker is still around. So back to Cacique Stababa. Cacique Stababa of the Calusa also governed a chain of islands called the Lucayo. And the Lucayan Tainos of the Bahamas are commonly called the Lucayo. Conquistador Hernando de, de Escalante Fontaneda who was shipwrecked in South Florida from the age of 13 to 30 years of age, lived with the Calusa, learning their language, documented the Tainos from Cuba, welcomed by Cacique Stababa, as well as he stated he witnessed indigenous from Honduras coming from the west to Florida, and was still present in 1560 cents. Mm -hmm. 
and May Canal. Originally stretching from Lake Okeechobee to the Gulf of Mexico, utilizing rivers along the way as a natural highway. city of Naples put this out. Uh, it's one of four others discovered in South Florida, the only place outside Mexico where similar canals were found. A small section of the Pine Island Canal remained at a 50-acre Pine Island site, once a major town inhabited by the native Calusa. The canal was dug mostly by an unknown tribe dominated by the Calusa Indians, which ruled the area from Fort Myers to south to the Marco Island. An 1877 expedition founded by the Smithsonian Institution showed roughly a mile-long canal that's about 50 feet wide and 25 feet below ground. It was used from about 700 AD and likely was abandoned by 1660. So that pretty much covers everything that um, plan and prepared on sharing with you today. Uh, I do have some other uh, information about ball games, uh, you know, Mesoamerica, uh, Central America is famous for their ball games. Uh, the Tainos in the Caribbean also had a ball game. Uh, we called it a bate, played in a bate court, uh, mainly a rectangular shaped uh, court, uh, and it was used just as the ball game was used in Mesoamerica to, dis to settle disputes, to, uh, to uh, make wagers on, uh, and then just pure competition. And with the uh, traveling of the migration from south to north, you know, things change a little. Everybody puts a little bit of their own twist. But in the Popol Vuh, remember all this correctly, uh, and one of the creation stories uh, in the ball game, one of the players' head becomes a ball. <laughs> but this is tied into the, the sacredness of the, the, the ball game, and, and this has continued, I believe, to the Caribbean, because our Bate courts uh, are actually on top of old sacred burials. This, uh, these Bate courts are aligned with the cosmos, with the solstices and, and uh, equinoxes, so they're very sacred places. In Florida, of course, the ball has changed, and you know it, it was a very violent game, uh, it was like uh, uh, very uh, hands-on physical uh, game with the Florida indigenous people, but the the connections there is that the indigenous peoples of Florida believe that burying a skull of an ancestor underneath the court before the game brought them good luck and brought them benefit to that to help them, you know, win that win the game. So this is a connection that's you know changed over the migration, but has basically stayed the same, as well as it was also a good omen for the indigenous peoples of Florida to add a scalp to the inside of the ball. Again, tying that back to the creation story in the Pope of Wool. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, we have a Facebook page, Yankee Jaguar. You can find me on uh, YouTube on the, uh, under the Florida Taino, T-A-I-N-O. Um, and I, I will be there's a lot more information, uh, and, and I still haven't really put it all together. So, and and it's possible. I don't know yet. I'm not getting my uh, getting too excited yet. But I've uh, been in touch with a filmmaker who's wanting to make an educational program on PBS. So maybe all the information I, I get, if that works out and, and works through, you may get a chance to see it on PBS. But if not, I will be sharing it on YouTube. Um, so you can find me on YouTube. Uh, the Florida Taino. Questions? Awesome. Oh, you did not. Yeah, how did you, when did you start getting interested in this and how well, did you go about doing your research? Being a 
uh, descendant. I, I grew up, you know, in Florida all my life. So, um, and then learning from my grandparents about my uh, ancestry um, uh, of being Taino. You know, I, nobody knew anything about Tainos anywhere. I would shop every Native every Native American shop. I hit libraries. You, you say Taino, and you go, huh? Cool. So finally, uh, the tour guide in St. Augustine uh, drove the red trains and gave tours. And I walked into a Native American shop in St. Augustine, and it just so happened to be a, a representative from the United Confederation of Taino People had just walked in there and left a bunch of information about Taino. <laughs> I was stoked. And the lady in the Native American shop was excited for me that she just handed everything they just gave her to me. So that started that opening of connecting with my ancestry. And then through that, um, I got in contact uh, indirectly with Alan Breck through another author in Florida. Um, and was invited to be part of the IE's Village Trail Archaeological Project, uh, which is a, a public archaeological project that was, um, and it uh, ran by Alan Breck. And, and these, knowing that Oh, the Taino never went to Florida. Well, well, why? The ship was right there. The hummus is right there. Oh, well, the currents are just so strong. It just didn't make sense to me. You know, we have these people who are beyond you know, what we know today in, in, in some fields. So that just drove my curiosity until um, I started talking to Alan about it. And then um, he's like, oh, yeah some archaeological evidence that points you that direction. So I ended up going to the big library in downtown Orlando, uh, looked up uh, the Cushing's dig in Key Marco, Florida, and then that, that was it. It just, and ever since then, he's supported me 100%, and, and anything he finds, he, he, he sends to me that might help me in my research, and I keep him in contact and give him full credit for getting me on the right track. You would think archaeologists or scientists in general have, would have like a database of open research questions and then a database of pro and con information and they don't but so Joey's kind of doing that um yeah it was, it was yeah so I, I think it's great I, I think we should have more issues that we're, we're like a debate or not a debate or whatever but we're, we're and anybody can do that anybody can compile um you know facts pro and con um so I think it's great yeah, I wish more people would do that with more issues yeah. Well, the scientists should be doing it, but I think we don't. Yeah, yeah. The con on that side is that the Taino were not in Florida. I'm, I'm not following. What yes, the, right. the, the typical belief, and, and it is slowly changing, but the typical belief is that Tainos never reached Florida, and the indigenous peoples of Florida never reached Cuba or the Bahamas. Well, I never went there, and I've lived here all my life. Right. Well, why had to compare the two? You didn't have a canoe. <laughs> yeah, I did. And that's a, a question I get too. Why don't people do it nowadays? But they they do. They have. There's been, I think, in not too long ago, a guy used a kayak and canoed from Cuba all the way to New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans. Yeah, I, I thought I, there's a slave uh, captivity narrative. I think from the 1840s. Brent, Brent, his last name's Hannon. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so he escapes from a, a slave ship, gets with the Indians of South Florida, Seminole, presumably, although they don't say what their name is. Somehow the, the, the whites get him and take him to Cuba. So what do the Indians do? They just get in their canoe and 12 hours later, I think it's 12 hours, I can't remember. My memory's mm -hmm. my, it might be long, but 12 hours later they're in Cuba demanding the, the, the black guy back. So, I mean, you know, and, and the Seminoles weren't really known for their maritime, they were interior kind of people um, living in the swamps and stuff. And um, so, you know, if the Seminoles would do that in the 1840s, just zip over to Cuba to, to retrieve, you know, an indentured servant. Why the hell not? Yeah, why would they have done Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if you're asking like the, the con evidence, why do people still disbelieve Joey's um, hypothesis? I, I mean, I think, Basically, we have this bias that um, if, if one uh, group of people has fancy pottery or fancy anything, and they get in contact with people who have less, that those people are automatically going to want that and adopt it or try to imitate it. And that's really not true. And we, you know, we can think from our own history, like the Semitic people, the Arabs and the Jews to this day, they don't have representational art. And they were surrounded by people who have really high quality representational art, and they're just sticking to their geometry. Um, very, very beautiful geometries, but it is kind of easier to do geometry than 
All right, but anyway, they didn't. They, so there are cultures of resistance where you you don't necessarily imitate everything that's fancy and advanced. We as Westerners, we think, well, if it's progress and it's fancy and it's advanced, everybody's going to want it. It's inevitable, and, it's, and you know, and we have in our own history we have examples where it's not true. Not true. Yeah, it's not true. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, um, how I, how did your family uh, preserve the knowledge of Taino heritage? And number two, did you use any kind of uh, you know DNA type testing or anything like that? And the third is. Have you contacted other people in Florida who are tuned to Taino? Or did they contact you? Um, okay, so the first question was, how, how did I retain the knowledge? Yes. Well, the, the Taino is in a, uh, a, a reconnection movement. It's a modern Taino movement. So because that, and that's the other thing, is that we've been, it's been taught that we're extinct. So, uh, you should show up. <laughs> <laughs> well, through oral history, we've known we've been here, but they've done DNA testing recently uh, with uh, another Taino Kasike, George Estevez, and Jorge Estevez and his family. And it, with that DNA testing, they've proven that we have existed. So it's kind of like you know the conquistadors come through, they destroy a bunch of stuff, and and do all these horrendous things, and then after they do that to you, they say, we need a count. <laughs> Who's here? <laughs> well, I just watched you slaughter my mother, my brother. I'm not telling you I'm here, you know? So, and, and then the Caribbean islands are full of caves, full of places to hide. Not to mention when there's a story of uh, Cacique Enrique, uh, Guadacuya, who is the first Treaty of Americans, who actually defeated the Spanish and jungle warfare. Um, and the, the Spanish uh, created a, a first treaty with the, the Tainos uh, in the uh, Dominican Harbor. Uh, your second question was, oh, that's what I was going to say. So because of that, a lot of the knowledge has been lost. Like our language is not fully intact because we really only have what's been recorded. Uh, Cacique uh, Jorge Estevez, uh, uh, has worked with the Smithsonian for many years. He is actively putting together a language, a modern day Taino language in, 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 in this book. And he's getting his, his Diego or his tribe, uh, um, and, and they're, they're pretty close to fluent in, in that so far. Um, so it, we're, we're reconnecting and we're, we're re, re establishing all that. I, I just learned about my, just that I was Taino. Um, you, you have to also remember too that in the islands, um, it was frowned upon, you know? It was kind of like, it was, it was a racist thing, you know? So it was frowned upon that you, you were saying Taino, uh, as well as you know, the Catholicism that uh, the Spanish brought. Uh, it, a lot of people didn't like that connection, were afraid of that connection, uh, so it was not talked about too much. But there are foods and drinks that still exist today that, are, that were used by our ancestors when Columbus first arrived that uh, we can still enjoy today. Uh, yucca, that's, you make cassava bread in yucca, and, and there's a uh, mabi drink, if I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your, your last question was? Have you uh, connected with other Taino in, in Florida and publicized? Yes. It? When I first got into the movement, I was everywhere. Uh, um, see, my dad is Irish German. My mom was from the island. So I was also raised in Okoe, where it was also very racist, and I was treated in certain ways. Uh, Okoe was controlled by the Klan at that time, still. 80s drinking out of a colored water fountain in Kmart. So Spanish was not taught in my household because my mom was trying to protect me from that stuff. So I, I missed out a lot because of that. Um, so when I first got into the movement, I was all there. I was telling everybody, you know, Tainos here, you know, anybody that would have a think come from the Caribbean. And most of them, I got a lot of rejection in the beginning. Way things have been taught 
throughout family. Um, and so then I, joining the United Confederation of Taino People, which is a, a large organization, they have representatives in the UN for our indigenous rights, um, and, and they do a lot of good work. Um, so I, I became a liaison officer with them. I was uh, representing us at the AIA powwow back in the day. Um, and Ty Pelly, who's uh, one of the main officers for the UN, for the United Confederation of Taino People. Um, and then uh, I joined a uh, uh, indigenous Caribbean network, or the Kane Circle, and was uh, practicing Taino spirituality. So I was giving ceremonies, and we had big gatherings throughout Central Florida where we would make connections to everybody. We have an exhibit at the uh, at Indian uh, Museum in Washington, Smithsonian. Yes, there are some Taino pieces there, uh, very famous <coughs> pieces there. Sir, you had a question? Yeah, I'd like to introduce some artifacts to talk about some things. That's all right. Sure. I'm going to crown conch just like you do. These come from the Gulf Coast. It's a horn. I'll conch lower also. Nice. That was dug up on a farm in Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is, uh, you're talking about the rubber. This is a Mayan rubber votive ball that I dug up in uh, South St. Petersburg, Florida. So this is miles from home. And all I could find about this is that if a traveler came across a swamp that he liked, and it was a great place, he would stop and do prayers, and he'd stick a feather in one of these and bury it. And this is the rubber that they make by mixing the plant acid. Wow. That's not supposed to be in Florida. No. And I've tried to get that verified by several different artifact companies and they won't touch it. They keep saying it has to be North American and I'm saying, I found this in Florida. And they're like, oh, well, we still want to deal with that. <laughs> so they don't want you to know things. There's a big cover up of, there's more than you could ever learn in one lifetime because this went on for 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. These oh, yeah. people all trading and living together. And, yeah. So yeah. there's, there's more than you can ever know. I, I, I show this to people, I take this to places where they have the G20 artifacts that are just priceless and they've never seen anything like this. Said, what? what is that? What Did is you that? get a carbon date? One guy told me to get it off his table because he said, that could be an old dried up dog turd for all I know. <laughs> I said, it's a Mayan rubber ball that I found yes. in Florida. And the guy just doesn't care. Did you get they out? don't want to know. You get a carbon date for about $700. We're Miami, it's called Data Analytics. You'd have to take a small piece off it. That's fine. Very Those pieces small fall off of it all the time. Well, and it's still got the original sand material in it, so it's and then for I would to just still Just find the lab that identifies rubber. Yeah. I can't find anybody that'll even, I can't find oh. it anywhere. I was I've, I've been trying to contact analysis. people that the their words are written in um, Mexican and they, they don't call me back. It's I wouldn't like, contact experts. I, you, you know how many times I've been blown up by experts? No, not experts. <laughs> I'm talking to people. I went on I went on several different social media sites and I typed in mine rubber votive ball. And I contacted everybody that was doing work about the uh, the, 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 the soccer game. And no one contacted me back. All right, well how about like, go to a list of um, professional materials analysis. The companies that do materials analysis, that's all they do. They just people send them their materials and say, what is it? Yeah. And for a thousand dollars or whatever, or a hundred thousand dollars, they'll tell you. If you need to find out if they made this here or if they made it somewhere well, abroad. Well, I think if you just got rubber and a carbon date before before white people started making rubber, I think boom, you're in. Yeah, yeah. Get, the, get it dated, and then you have some more. Some more and just in general, I mean, the, the, one of the problems with with with, with finding art because I before I was an archaeologist, I used to collect arrowheads. And I was a looter. That's what so, I was looking for, yeah. Right. The problem, the one of the side. problems is you find something great, and it's like, well, how do we know? You no provenience. Yeah, right. Like, say you say, hey, I got the Book of Mormon Part 2. I, I found my photographs my parts. How at the location, know? so there's you geotech. You know, so it's like, that's the problem, is when you the find something great. The original photographs are geotech, with me in the hole. Stand up to my chest. Oh, no, I, I was on the table. Oh, yes, yeah, so I, I don't have a whole lot of artifacts. These are uh, replicas uh, of corn cob vessels of, of, that are typically found in Florida. Uh, they were actually broken, so I put them back together and glued them back together as a puzzle. Uh, and then I have one authentic Taino artifact in here, uh, a replica of a point 
And then the ones in this case are pottery shards from Florida, typical check stamps, and there's some jet in here found from a mound. Don't forget your. You love Potuto. My own new hoe that I'm working on. Uh, this is a Maya Wakan. What we call Maya Wakan, so a Taino drum. Typically, uh, they would make our drums out of tree log. Uh, and uh, you know, form that H, and uh, you, you get two different tones. Uh, this one, uh, I, I made this one out of bamboo. This is a petroglyph in Puerto Rico. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, the, the comp or the, the horn we call guamo in our language. I'm pretty good at this, but it's probably way too loud in here. <laughs> do it. Yeah, do it. Make us do it. Both do it. Do it. <laughs> All right. They are loud. Ready? big honor for me. I really appreciate you guys coming and listening to me. I've, I've worked on this a lot. I'm just an amateur researcher. Um, so when I was invited to do this, it's just, you know, uh, yes, you great. did. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Smoke with Lakona, abundant blessings. You guys have a safe journey home. <laughs>